subscribers. How's everyone doing? Hi. Hello, beloved subscribers, followers. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel and subscribing to us. We're happy to have you with us. Uh, today, my name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. Let me not forget that. Uh, I run a Facebook store, uh, Chemistry. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, and again, my name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. Sometimes I get ahead of, ahead of myself and I forget to introduce, make a proper introduction. I just dive on in. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about psychology and uh, if you've been on this spiritual path for a little bit uh, and if you've been meditating maybe you have been journeying to other places uh, you know other realms or you've been seeing other beings uh, maybe you've had contact with your spirit guides uh, and for those of us that you know are not sure how all of this works, uh, how uh, developing spiritually and having contact with angelic beings or the Orishas or the Voodoo or the ancestors. For those of you that are you know, just not so sure about how these things work, uh, I want to discuss that today. I want to discuss uh, psychology. Uh, and the power of our minds from a, a psychological perspective uh, exploring the soul and spirit of humans so you know to, in order for you to really get into this deep you're really going to have to understand your psychology and how your mind works that's really what this is all about you know your mind uh, is your soul it is your spirit so the more you can explore your mind and what it does uh, the more spiritual growth and information you'll be able uh, to retrieve and the more you will grow okay uh, I'm seeing that on this path as I heal and uh, plus uh, I have used the journey work to heal myself too I can go in and uh, to these scenarios and do psycho spiritual treatment and heal certain parts of myself as well uh really tapping into my mind and uh reading myself of those old traumas uh and going back and changing the scenario so and you and this is possible you know this is totally possible uh i've been doing it on myself i would love to host a workshop on something like this uh and just show uh, how beneficial it is but let me read um, I want to read a paper to you uh, called the shamanic perspective where Jonathan thought and archetypal shamanism converge by Bunny Bright uh, you can find this paper it, it's an 18 page paper but I'm only going to go over a few pages of it with you uh, if you want to find this paper online, uh, I, I'll leave um, the information here so you can go research it online and read this paper for yourself. But this is this is this paper is written from a psychological uh, point of view uh, of what psychologists had to say about the uh, evolution of the human mind and consciousness and how it has all these archetypes in it. Uh, and I've heard people talk about that, about the Orishas, too. I, he I heard Bobby Hemi talk about how the Orishas are us, how the an angels are us. We are them. They these are the beings that live inside us. We're not really meant to worship them, but find the divinity that's within us and worship ourselves. Uh, that I've heard Bobby Hemi talk about this. Cause all of these are energies, and all these energies live within us. Uh, and even from a scientific point of view, you can really understand the biology because we are connected to our environment and everything around us biologically as well. Everything around us sustains us and keeps our human form, okay, this physical form, okay. Uh, so I wanted to delve in a little bit more 
and talk about uh, shamanism and the psychology of our minds and uh, exploring our minds through shamanism. This is a great tool. Uh, another example of this, uh, if you haven't seen seen the movies Wrinkle in Time, that is a prime example of a, sh a shamanic journey. I mean, when I seen that movie, it knocked me off my feet because that's how it was uh, traveling, uh, journeying into the inner worlds of my mind. It was just like that. And they talked about some of those things in that movie. Very good movie if you, if you want to know more about shamanism. Uh, and really want to know how the mind really works. Uh, if you're interested in that, and you just want to see, you know, uh, you know uh, how it really works, how how it, they're explaining it. Go watch Wrinkle in Time. It's a very good movie. They that I give it five stars. It was just that good on how they didn't quite say it was a form of shamanism, but they talked about the uh the possibilities of the mind the incredible ability of the of the mind that that was the emphasis on the in the movie so uh, i wanted to start off uh first let's let's uh look into jonathan first both jonathan psychology and shamanism focus on wholeness as a state of health shamanism defines health as being in balance with the sacred and lack of health as a violation violation of the will of the sacred okay so if you're not in balance and got yourself aligned with these universal laws there's going to be an imbalance in you either mentally you know spiritually or physically there's going to be some sort of uh, imbalance smith in 2007 establishes that jennifer thought identifies health as a wholeness and pathology or a lack of health as a lack of wholeness he characterizes the sacred as an experience of something that evokes rapture, awe, exaltation, or ecstasy. Something that is even dreadful in its intensity and power. As opposed to profane or ordinary, sacred is often perceived in contemporary culture as something alien or other. Though indigenous, indigenous and earth-based earth cultures likely made no distinction between the sacred and the profane in, my, in life. At least I am increasing aware that the sacred is not something I experience in my busy everyday routine. Unless somehow I slow myself down to witness a sunset or feel, feel, into, feel into a sudden sense of longing or love. Only then in the spaciousness of attention am I aware I have generally tuned the sense of something powerful, tuned out the sense of something powerful un unknown. Something sacred often invokes a feeling of mystery, wonder, the power of words to describe. As I touched on earlier, John often used the term numinous to connote the sacred, describing it as something which provides an experience or alteration of consciousness independent of, of human will, arousing, affecting, bedazzling, or blinding one to uh, other realities. Both sacred and numinous are words connected to the idea of this of soul the creative sacred life force that imbues all things with energy and meaning james hillman in 1982 described the soul as not just an element region or dimension but rather as a perspective as a deeply noticing penetrating and insight he seeks to extend the soul beyond humanity to the world at large, to forms and objects around us, whether natural or man-made. Each thing Hillman claims has a spark of soul at its core. He challenges us to imagine a world, a world soul, the anima, moon, mundi, as the particular soul spark that offers itself through each thing in its visible form. John considered psychology deeply tied to the soul, so much that he referred to psychologists as doctors of the soul. Similarly, Smith in 2007 states that the province of the shaman as technicians of sacred is disorders of the soul. Eliot, I think that's how you spell his name, in 1974 uh, calls shamans masters of ecstasy, stating the shaman is the great specialist in human soul. He alone sees it 
for he knows its form and its destiny. Smith noting the pathological condi conditions emerging in contemporary cultures posits that shamans would diagnose Western societies not as having breach in relations with the sacred, but as having no relation at all with the sacred. As individual in modern culture, Smith continues, we have repressed the contents of unconscious and similarly forgotten it entirely, disregarding the magic and mystery be, uh, there. Shamans and those commonly called folk healers rely on the power that issues from the sacred to conduct their healing activities. And the sheer lack of it in current times and culture epitomizes the tremendous precept uh, I can't pronounce that word. Precip precis I don't know how to uh, precipis on which we perch as a result. John sensing the enormity of the split between conscious and everyday lifestyle between our con conscious everyday lifestyle and the vast depth of our psych wounds, we do not understand yet yet that the discoveries of the unconscious means an enormous spiritual task which must be accomplished if we wish to preserve our civilization according to john the only way to address the deep loss of connection to the soul is that we experience we are experiencing as a species is to establish our connection to the sacred and Lath reports that the practice of shamanism has been around for millennia, essentially as long as humans have existed, and its oldest spiritual healing tradition still in use today. Though the word shaman emerged from Siberia via Russian language, shamanism is, is historically found in virtually every culture in the world. And Lath emphasized shamans care li like doctors that perform miracles like magicians. They manipulate the sacred, in fact, have access to ridges of sacred not accessible to other members of the community. Shamans are often linked to events surrounding life and death, healing and health and spirits in the underworld. Not only are they responsible for the religious direction of a community, they also guard its soul. So they're, they're letting you know that shamanism was the first form of psychology because these psychologists they had to go to shamans to really understand uh, how they were able to do this and when and the more they discovered they, they learned with the shamans they learned that this uh, these shamans uh, were, were basically the first psychologists and they were using their mind to do this they were using their environment uh, the things that they knew in nature and the power of their mind to do this so uh, we can, we can, uh, our shamans, you know, we can honor, give honor to our first shamans as being the first psycho-spiritual healers uh, to humanity. You know, they were just medical doctors. And um, these psychologists really wanted to understand how this was possible. And as they began to uh, learn more about shamanism, they uh, found more benefits with it. A uh, John... You know, Junk is, is really, he's very unique to me because he used some of these practices uh, when he treated some of his patients. So that's why he's just so, uh, he's very interesting and very peculiar to me because I think that was, I think that was, a, uh, that was really dope the way he used his profession and then he, he uh, used the teachings of the ancients to heal his patients. So I thought that was so dope. Uh, that he explored that. And like I said, Jung was a child of trauma too. So he uh, he learned the power of his mind by going in, healing himself of his childhood trauma. Uh, now let's go on to the sacred manifests in nature. The concept of sacred is inexplicably tied to an animistic belief system. The impression that the world and everything in it is imbued with life, intelligence, and spirit. Thus, in the physical and material world, the sacred manifests through wild nature as an infinite source of life and creativity, waxing and whining in eternal cycles of death and, and rebirth. Shamans, shamans read nature regarding and interpreting the elements of events that, that communicate 
through soul at all times and places. Jung mourned the loss of shamanic perspective of contact between modern man and nature, and he identified our increasing analytical thinking and desi desire for progress through manipulation of natural world as devastating to our well-being. Historically, in nature-based cultures, everything could be explained by maintenance of right relations to the sacred, the divine force that holds the world together. When something went wrong in a family, a village, a culture, it was obvious that something was radically out of balance with the world. The gods had been offended and equilibrium had, been had to be restored. As John suggested, as modern man has increasingly developed, developed casual thinking and has pursued science and technology as our foremost religion, we have placed ourselves at the top of hierarchy that regulates nature, wilderness, and the imaginal to lesser status and importance. Nature has become something we explore and control, and the imaginal realm something to analyze, define, or explain away as a revelant fantasy. No longer do we turn to these dimensions to gain insight and understanding from the gods of the ancestors who who came before us, or to engage with them to re-establish balance. In fact, it is nev it never even occurs to us to try. John grasping our plight, laminate, and this is something that he directly said. Uh, he said, there are no longer any gods whom we can invoke to help us. The great religions of the world suffer from increasing an anemia because the helpful namina have fled from the woods, rivers, and mountains, and from animals, and the god men have disappeared underground into the unconscious. There we fool ourselves that we lead an inogamous existence among the relics of our past. Our present lives are dominated by the goddess reason. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't, you know, that statement, I don't know about that who is our greatest and most tragic illusion. By aid of reason, we are we assure ourselves we have conquered nature. Uh, I don't like him calling uh, uh, the uh, uh, reason the goddess, but uh, yeah, reason has really destroyed our imagination because we do, when we go into meditation, uh, if you have been doing meditation, if you're seeing things and, and you're, you're imagining things and uh, and you're questioning, is that really going on? Uh, we do ourselves a disservice because, you know, those images and pictures that we see in meditation or the places that we travel, they really have a lot to do with our spiritual unfoldment. unfoldment and they help us uh, learn more about ourselves, you know. We're learning more about ourselves when we go into our inner worlds, when we go into our inner minds. We're really finding out what we really need and what we need to discard when we go into these imaginary worlds. And then we also uh, look at our power that, that we're not even able to see on this physical realm. But when we go into these inner worlds, we're able to see our spirit guides, our power animals, and our, you know, our the superhero us, the god us, uh, when we go into this, uh, these inner worlds. And we really tap into our inner power. Uh, you know, I think... You know, we are really doing ourselves a disservice about not trusting ourselves, going within, and, and practicing this. Because this is something that our ancient ancestors practiced. They practice it now. But like I said, I don't see too many, I don't hear uh, too many uh, people speak on this. I don't hear too many, uh, as a metaphysical minister, uh, having... Uh, my, the foundation of my work is psycho-spiritual treatment, the power of the mind, the will of the mind, uh, you know, and I think it's important to really speak out on this, uh, you know, speak on it, so to speak, because I don't hear many uh, spiritualists or uh, African traditional, re you know, religion practitioners speak on this subject because when they're doing the Odoo and when we're doing you know our readings 
we're really tapping into a unif a consciousness. We're tapping into that imaginary world. We are, you know, looking at pictures and images of when we're doing card readings. And even when you're doing an ado, you're listening to these different uh, myths and stories uh, to really explain the energies that are surrounding you. Because that's, that's basically what it is. And it is dealing with our psychology, our thinking, our behaviors, and our attitudes. Okay? And that's really what uh, uh, psychology and psycho-spiritual treatment is. It's being able to go in and look at these energies that are out of balance, that are manifesting in negative behaviors and attitudes, and being able to tap back in and bring those things uh, into balance. You know, that, that's really affecting our psychology. It's really affecting our minds. So uh, that's very important. I don't hear many people talk about these experiences. But that's exactly what the priest is doing. That's exactly what the shaman is doing. It's going in mentally. Uh, you both are going in, doing that inner work, balancing those energies and correcting those behaviors and attitudes. Okay, to get you in a higher vibration. Okay, so let me go on. I'm going to go on with this. Uh, and I, I, this that was pages one through four of this document. Uh, I didn't want to read the whole document. I think the document is 18 pages long, 16 pages long. So I'm going to read four, 14 through 16. Uh, this is a really juicy paper. Uh, just like my book when I wrote about consciousness. Uh... And even if you take a closer look at the um, look in the Bible, uh, most of these priests or even Jesus, they lived a life like a shaman. You know, uh, if you take a closer look at, at these stories, uh, you will see more of these priests and these prophets and stuff. They live a shamanic lifestyle. Okay? And that's that's how they had their contact with God. So let me go on. The solution John insisted is for us to descend into the unconscious to engage with the missing libido through symbolic thought. This is what the shaman does when he or she journeys to other realms to garner insights, to do battle, or to retrieve a lost soul. What the psychologist and patient do through dream work or active imagination. It's the same thing. I just discussed that. By engaging with the symbolic form and entering into the relationship with in order to understand their significance in our daily life, vitality can be restored as the ego once again gains access to the energy it requires. Okay, so you can go in and do journey work with people. Uh, that's one reason why I made those meditations uh, on there because uh, there is a way that you can go in and journey and do that healing work. You can also, uh, I also want to practice it one-on-one, uh, -on -one, really uh, setting up the psychology with that person and going, on, going in within their mind uh, doing the, the journey work as, as well. And that can be done by letting the, the patient or the client set up the scenario during meditation and you just follow you just follow them on on that journey as they uh they they talk you through uh the level of con what they're experiencing in their consciousness so you go there with them uh this is just like inception uh the movie wrinkle in time we can do this but what what's the problem with us if we discount our imagination we have been told that this is not real, this is fantasy. But no, it is real. The universe came into form by, uh, by thought. Okay? So don't you think your imagination is that much more important? Because it is our thoughts that's keeping all of this together uh, in the first place. If you watch my video, Level of Consciousness, I'm sure you understand that. I also re review some information in that video as well. But, you know, if you want to progress in your spirituality, uh, you know, we have to get into the psychology of our minds. Okay? Though they travel in, in what same, some, lev 
some label invisible realms, shamans are no strangers to direct experience. A shaman has immediate concrete experiences with gods and spirits. He sees them face to face. He talks with them, prays to them, implores them. Ryan insists that when a shaman through ritual vision, journeying, or dreams visit the realm of spirit, it is not figurative or metaphorical. He actually encounters the archetypal, archetypal realm and the landscape therein. Similar, similarly, Alan and Sabini in 1997 maintain that it is imperative that every individual learn to dialogue directly with the spiritual dimension through journeying or active imagination rather than relying on intermediary, intermediary as most religions have done for centuries. Direct interaction with the spiritual dimension can heal disassociation, dismemberment by establishing the link between the ego and the self. So they're letting you know the church is doing nothing but playing the middleman. We're like keeping you from your own psychology, keeping you from ascending to your godhood because all of us are supposed to have these interactions uh uh, with with our minds, with our archetypes like that, with our higher selves like that. We're supposed to have that. Uh, the, the object is to shrink the ego and build on the higher, on the higher self, which is the inner God, which is the Christ consciousness, uh, as they call it. Many are calling it. Uh, I mean, I tell you, uh, if anyone, if you're following my channel and if you uh, 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 listen to my audio on my shamanic uh, journey experience, it was so profound, uh, and it really changed my perspective on the power of our minds. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, but when I when I made up my mind that I wanted to have contact uh, with these Orishas, and I seen how my mind instantly set up that scenario, and how that contact was so real in my mind. You know, it was profound. You know, our minds can do our minds can do amazing things. So, uh, and this is something that our ancient ancestors was tapped into. This is something that they practice and commit. Uh, this is what Reiki is all about: tapping into the power of your mind, being able to focus focus that healing energy on healing yourself or healing somebody else. This this energy is also within your mind, but you're also pushing. Uh, this Bolivian energy that's in our universe, you're also utilizing it too to do the healing work as well. It's it's that free, uh, high vibrational energy that's present in nature that we can use uh, in our healing works once we become conscious of it. Okay, this is really juicy stuff. I mean, I get really excited about uh, telling uh, this 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 reading. This it, it's really exciting to me. Overall, Jung believed the most compelling and transformational direct experience is the descent. In biblical myth, paradise was an undifferentiated unconscious. All different differentiation and self-knowing came from the fall, which symbolized the beginning of consciousness. When Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and recognize their nakedness and the difference between the heaven and hell, similarly, and this is this is the same thing your consciousness this that story is really about our consciousness moving inside inside uh, into the physical body because we were we were just first consciousness we chose to express ourselves through a physical body similarity and descent into the underworld whether through shamanic initiation or through john called the night sea journey a dark night of the soul gifts us with the different nation differentiation, growth, and ultimately transformation. Okay? And that's also, um, that, that's different. I'll talk about that at another time. I think I've already discussed that. If you're not familiar, familiar with journeying, please go watch my uh, video on a, a book review on Jung and shamanism. I talk a little bit about that. In shamanic initiation, Symbolic dismemberment incurs direct experience of the sacred as ritual death and rebirth take place. The initiate is reassembled and reborn as a new being, a shaman with power and potential. Shamanic initiation, Alan and Sabini agree, requires various numbers of stages ascending and descending the world tree. 
a central axis that provides access to other realms, each time gaining greater consciousness of the unified reality of transcendent dimension. And every day we each must make a descent in order to gain experience, encounter deeper aspects of ourselves, and emerge again, transform in the process of the initiation. So, you know, once you begin to journey, I've heard people say that too. Uh, some people, a power animal, when they go in, uh, attacks them and, and um, dismember them. But that's being done out of love. It's a, it's, a, it's a form of rebirth. The old you is dying and the new higher you is taking form. So if you ever experience that on a shaman, shamanic journey, that is quite normal. Okay, that is normal. If your power animal attacks you or you attack and you're dismembered uh, on your journey, you're going through the initiation process of being reborn. Okay, uh, but I encourage you to read some more books on shamanism and to uh, really uh, explore the psychology of your mind. See how your mind works. Don't be afraid to unfold. Uh, and, and see, that's another reason why I wrote that book, uh, Cannabis and Shamanism, because I know, uh, and like I said, I think I've already been unconsciously traveled. Um, I know with cannabis, and it doesn't take a lot, it takes very small amount. I use an indica strain because the Steve is going to make your mind think, 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 think. But it gives you the tendency to let go. You just let go and just let your mind do what it does naturally, okay? After you set your intentions and set the scenario uh, of being where you in your sacred place, let your mind go ahead and and go on the journey. Let it go. Uh, you know, if you're having problems, some people do DMT, some people do uh, peyote. Uh, uh, what is the other one? Other one, uh, Savia. Can't pronounce that. Uh, you know, there's so many others out there. Awaska, there's so many others out there that can help you uh, unfold psycho psychologically. Because the more you tap into your mind, your mind is tapped into the all mind. And you, when you get in, into that, that collective unconscious like that, you know, you're opening up your third eye. You're able to see things from a wider perspective, you know. And you're able to transcend, you, you transform and transcend and go to that next level in your consciousness. I hope that made sense to you guys. John believed the self, the centering archetype to be the ego transcendent, calling it God within us. Because it has preconceived blueprint for, for wholeness and knows what is best for the ego. It will nudge us toward the path of, of greatest growth. There is, there is telos, destiny, factors associated with the self. Then that allows it to guide and regulate individuation. The unfolding, the strategy for wholeness. While we, while we may not choose the descent to the underworld with our egoic mind, the self may send us toward downward to our destiny because it is there where we will garner wholeness through the direct experience of challenges and conflicts like brings. You know, so sometimes we go, we're wounded. Uh, you, you find that too, you become the wounded healer. You, you have all these traumas, you've experienced all that, and that's because yourself is trying to refine you for something greater. These conflicts are supposed to make you uh, face everything and rise, so to speak. Uh, when you look at your fear, uh, you know, some people say false evidence appearing real. No, it's face everything and rise, and that's really what you're supposed to be doing. A lot of people, especially cancer patients, uh, when they've experienced cancer and they come back and they, they've learned to live a spiritual, healthy lifestyle, uh, they have become the wounded healer. They have healed themselves. Anyone who's healed themselves from some trauma, they have now become uh, their, their higher self. They're living the best lives. Okay. Uh, in spite of our current collective culture crisis, Jung inferred that the loss of, of instinct, the loss of soul, which is the root of our pathology, can be restored through reconnection with the sacred aspects of the natural imaginal worlds. 
darkness darkness is an aspect of nature in our descent to reconnect to our roots and wild nature the deep levels of sight like bees that are lost from the hive we may encounter destruction violence devouring forces dismemberment death and decay we may battle dark forces pit our strength against demons gatekeepers those who seek to destroy instead of create we may navigate unknown territory dark waters and close tight spaces we may even enter We may even enter in the impenetrable dark night of the soul where all hope seems lost. But John urged us to look for the seed in darkness that will come to fruition and light, stating a civilization does not decay, it, re it regenerates. The hive is being dismembered through the loss of the bees. It behooves us to understand that dismemberment is the first act of initiation. What is broken into pieces can be remembered and, and begun anew like initiates who emerge as a powerful shaman. It is possible through the process of descent to reconnect with the sacred earth to restore our souls to their rightful wholeness, both individually and and as a culture by remembering our roots in the sacred by reestablishing right relations with nature and the imaginal we renew our trust in the power of the soul to help us find our way home uh i thought this was a great, a great paper uh and and the book says some of the same things but if you can't uh afford the book right off and you're really trying to understand the psychology in your mind and what your consciousness has to do with your spiritual development, I encourage you to read that, this paper, okay? Uh, and I thank you. I hope this video was not too long. Uh, and if you want, you're trying to understand more about this, go watch Wrinkle in Time. Go watch Jumpers. Go watch Inception. Go watch uh, the movie Surrogates, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence uh, that's another good one as well but that that has to do with that you know putting the consciousness in a you know a, 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 a artificial body or whatever but if you, you're trying to really understand shamanism uh, you know those are some good movies to watch uh, the, the the power of our minds and what they can do uh, but you can also go get the book uh, Jung and Shamanism Read more about Jung. Read more about uh, shamanism. Uh, and that is the practice of our ancient ancestors. Those practices have just been warped into religions. You know, they turn into, uh, you know, and I tell people this about the Arish Arishas. Uh, you know, you see Ifa, you see Yoruba, you see uh, Lukumi. Uh, all of these religions and traditions are centered around the Arishas. So what does that tell you? The Rishas are not religious deities or energies. It is the traditions that's built around the Arishas that is the religion. Okay, so you don't need a religion or, or a middle person to help you have these connections uh, with the Arishas, with the Vudun, or uh, the Egyptian Parthenon. These uh, archetypes are already within us uh, once we make up our minds that we want to have these um, relationships and connections uh, with these uh, archetypes, we can go in and we can have these connections with them, okay? And, and I know that's very hard to believe because we have been taught otherwise that we need someone experienced to do it. But if you trust your mind and if you really want to do the healing work, you have the power to do it. We have the power to do it. Uh, and this is something that our ancient ancestors is well aware of. And now we're coming back in that era where this myth, where this knowledge is being given to all of us. Uh, that's, that really was the story. That, that Jesus story, that's what that was all about. All of us are shamans. All of us are healers. You know, all of us have to take responsibility uh, for our well-being. 
okay and that's what that is all about it's 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 not the death or the death or the resurrection or the birth of jesus that's important i don't even like using it as, as a example but for my religious brothers and sisters that's in there like that uh that's how that story is meant to be uh for those are you know those that are in other religions and if you're if you're hindering uh brothers and sisters from evolving by saying oh it can only be this this way you're only hindering that because that is a tradition that your ancestors passed down okay and i, I see it's a beautiful thing if you want to follow with that you find that that works for you fine great you know uh fine great but i just don't like you know i don't think it is a right um uh, it is the right what am i assessment to say that if you don't do it this way you won't have any contact with the orishas if you don't do it this way you won't have any contact with god if you do it if you don't do it this way you know what i'm saying they're you're putting restrictions on on your on, on your spiritual development and really, there is no restrictions on this. Once we start understanding our minds and the psychology of it and how it works, uh, the more successful you're going to be. Bobby Hemme talked about that when he talked about the Rishas and Elect, but we're just as equal to them. Uh, they're inside of us, okay? So there is no, you know, worship really there. We work together because these are archetypes that live within us. Uh, I hope this video helped you. I hope you gained something from it. Uh, thank you so much for following us and subscribing to us. If you uh, please like and share our videos. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you.